You ready? There is a connection between the paranormal, UFOs, and the myths of ancient history. The clues are scattered across the landscape from a forbidden past. Maybe even in your own backyard. There is a connection between the true nature of our reality, consciousness, and the unexplained. I'm Carl the Crusher. Let's explore the unknown. Welcome back to the Carl Crusher channel. I'm really excited about this video tonight with Roger. I want to also make some really important announcements that we have set up uh, workshops and an inner circle Patreon group for the Reindigenizing Minds project, specifically for Roger and Colleen to be able to share all of their knowledge and information and a lot more in depth from what you're gonna learn just in this introductory video where I'm talking with Roger tonight. So make sure and check all the links down in the description box below and go become a Patreon Inner Circle member, sign up for the workshops and you can learn a lot more about everything that we're gonna talk about. Also, I have a Patreon and Etsy store. I have a lot of cool stuff going on in my link tree, so make sure and check all of that out. You can become a Skinwalker Insider as well as go over to the Mount Wilson link tree and you can get a day pass or overnight pass or become uh, a club member over there to be able to come up to Mount Wilson Ranch and see me as well. But also right here where I'm at right now is up in a canyon near where I live, kind of in my backyard. And I've been invited to present as part of the Zion Yoga Festival. And Roger and Colleen, there's a good chance that they're gonna be able to come and help be a part of that with me where we're gonna be talking a lot about a lot of really cool stuff and maybe having some interactive experiences where you can meet me uh, in person and Roger and Colleen up here of the Reindigenizing Minds Project uh, right here up in this beautiful canyon in southern Utah and have a really amazing experience. So make sure and check out all the information for the Zion Yoga Festival and use the code Carl Crusher to get a 10% discount for that. And it's the beginning of September. Come and check it out. Come meet me at Mount Wilson and go over to the Patreon and become a member of the Inner Circle. We'll see you there. Well, how's it going? I'm just making it so I don't look washed out and and no disrespect, but I don't want to look like a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Trying to put some color back in me in there. <laughs> keep washing my face out. And I'm going, all I see is eyes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think you, I can see you fine. I think you look great. Okay, there we go. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not pretty to begin with, but. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. We're all good. I don't want to just scare tourists, you know. We'll let the wild Indian in. <laughs> You're all good. So you've been, uh, man, it's been a minute since we've been able to like go over all the stuff we've kind of been working on. Did you get a chance to look at that big medicine wheel I sent you? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, that's uh, why I responded with that uh, underwater uh, um, wall that comes from Cape Mendocino. Yeah. Um. Apparently, the 40 degree latitude where that medicine wheel is pointing uh, to Ute Mountain, uh, to Mount Baldy, um, and then I believe to um, Wheeler Peak above where you're at, on Becky's Peak, which is at 40 degrees. Dinner's ready. And then uh, you take that 40 degrees and you go all the way out to California, it'll take you to that Mendocino, the Cape Mendocino, which is really strange because that stone uh, structure there goes straight to China from here. I mean, like everybody's arguing about- Oh yeah, that. you're talking, oh yeah, you're talking about the, uh, the stone wall that goes clear across the ocean. Yeah, I just sent it to you on Facebook. I just sent, uh, put it on your uh, messenger. At the very bottom, last picture I sent you was it shows the entire wall. If you want to, okay, I'm just. How about I do this? Why don't I just pull up Google Earth and you can kind of navigate me? Okay, this right here. If you look where it says San Francisco, 
and yeah. you go a little above San Francisco, that's Mendocino, uh, Cape Mendocino right here. Uh, Cape Mendocino is at 40 degrees latitude, and that is where this underwater wall goes all the way over to Asia. And if you follow this 40 degrees, it hits all those places I was mentioning all the way to King's Peak in the Unitah Basin. The Winnemucca is also aligned to this wall. They use this wall to trade with Asia. And then the red dots that are going down is the so-called mystery wall. The mystery stone wall that's coming from the Columbia River goes down south into Southern California and off the coast of California. And it takes you directly to the area where the Easter Islands are located. From that point on, when you get to the other side of the equator, they could trade with the people in South America. And then the next island over from uh, Easter Island is Tahiti, which is connects you to the rest of the Polynesian islands, including Hawaii and, and so forth from there, from that point on. And from that point on also, that's also the connection uh, that went through the Polynesia to get to Australia, New Zealand, and also the wall right here takes you right to the center of 39 degrees in Japan. This is where the, this would probably, this wall ends up more than likely at 40 degrees in Japan too. And if you go to 35 degrees, which is really weird because over here on 35 degrees, which is our Sandia Mountain over here, you could follow Sandia Mountain and Mount Taylor, which is at 35 degrees. Humphreys Peak, which is at 35 degrees. Wallapai Peak, which is at 35 degrees. And I think it's the Caliente Mountain, which is at 35 degrees off of California. Mm -hmm. And if you keep following 35 all the way to Japan, and the first mountain you hit when you go to Japan at 35 degrees is Mount Fuji. Fuji, yeah. And 35 degrees was the latitude for uh, utilizing for trade. And um, that, that 40 degrees and the medicine wheel that you found is aligned uh, to this wall. Do you have photos of the wall in your folder there? Uh, I have so, another one that goes by Hawaii, which is a little better picture, but I'd have to figure out. You to also look. told me you sent me a video on YouTube. Maybe I can pull that up in a second as well. Um, that shows a guy that uh, I can't remember the name of his YouTube channel. I'll try to find it. If I end up uploading this in like what we're doing now to the YouTube. Yeah, there was some. An Lone, I, is it Lone Wolf or something like that? I can't remember the name of it. Oh, Wandering Wolf. Wandering Wolf. Yeah, Wandering he, Wolf. He's going and finding all those uh, megalithic the, walls. Um, I think at the 44th degree latitude, and that's what I was trying to tell you, that's the Chinook uh, uh, trade zone. The, the 40 uh, degree latitude going north from 39 to 49, we have polygonal megalithic structures, and that's why that on top of the Mesa by Skinwalker Ranch is a polygonal floor where a, a temple used to once sit, which utilized our edge of our trade zone. And if you go down to 39 degrees to 29 degrees, you'll notice like you noticed over at what you call the Mystery Mesa, they call them trincheras or the rows of rocks that you were finding, the walls of rocks. Those are trincheras. Those were used to utilize the trade zones for uh, this area from 39 degrees, where Pyramid Peak area, down to 29 degrees, which is the Angel Island down in uh, Baja, California, which was utilized for that trade zone. And then when you go from 29 down to 19, people recognize what they used for there. They used pyramids, you know, like, you know, Aztecs, Toltecs, Teotihuacan and all of that. And then if you go from 19 degrees to nine degrees, what they utilized from Veracruz were the Olmec stone heads that, that were being found, um, the multi-ton stone heads that were being found. They were being utilized for marking out their trade zones. And then from nine degrees to the equator or the Costa Rica area, they were utilizing uh, these large megalithic stone spears to mark out their trade zones. And so all of these things were utilized to mark latitudes and longitudes. The biggest pill people are gonna have a hard time swallowing, including my own native people, is that not only we knew latitudes and longitudes, but 
we knew how to utilize them. And even my own people are having a hard time, you know, believing that we understood latitudes and longitudes. And all of these ancient places, if you go on and check them out, they're all related to, not all, but most of them are related to latitudes and longitudes for travel so you could do trade. Yeah, <laughs> it's just mind-blowing. I know, and... it's, it's the real truth. And the, the bottom line is that these alignments are also set up in a, such a way that if you go to 124 and 123, you hit the Nahani um, Valley up in Canada, which is a direct alignment to my Columbia River. The Nahani Valley uh, has rumors that there's still prehistoric animals there. In other words, dire wolves, wolves that were from the Stone Age that are still theoretically still alive today. Woolly mammoths, saber tooth tigers, um, bear dogs, and all kind of weird things that you never heard of. Now, this is what I'm thinking. If these critters are still very much alive and they're the skinwalker uh, um, power, uh, what makes you think that they, they, they couldn't get an ancient dire wolf or an ancient gigantic uh, human from the ancient times and become that if they could become animals like they are down here in the Southwest? Why couldn't they become prehistoric animals, which would explain the, the, the dogmen, the skinwalkers, the gigantic wolves that are wandering around Utah. And um, there's also an interesting aspect is that zero and five longitudes, not latitudes, the long way down, the zeros and fives are our reality uh, lines. But if you go not off from zero to five to the next numbers that are around those numbers, like four, five, six, Five is our reality. Uh, four and six are astral lines. And if you look at it that way, uh, that means we're in the middle. And native logic says that the astral line to the right of us is where the sun rises, which means that's a positive astral longitude. So positive astral entities probably can travel up that one. And on the other side of us is like a negative astral longitude, which uh, negative uh, astral entities can travel down. See where I'm going with this? Yes. And our reality is, is sandwiched between the two. <clears throat> just, like, uh, just like the positive and negative ends on a battery or a toroidal energy field. Exactly. You've got the, the coronal ejection and the intake, and there's a positive effect and a negative effect. There's a an upload and a download type of a response to all of that. And in our reality, it, like you said, is where <clears throat> this, the surface tension of the, of those realities kind of meets together. Is that kind of you what thought, you mean a little bit? Uh -huh, and I could even explain it even more in detail where you're at in Mount Wilson would be a good example of how I'd explain it. Okay. The Payrock petroglyphs, which are at 37 degrees below Mount Wilson, which are on the longitude uh, uh, on the same as Mount Wilson. Uh huh. That w wait, which petroglyphs? I wonder if I can see them. The can you see? Rock. Can you see on screen what I'm doing with? Yeah, the... I can see it switching it around. Yeah. The okay. Is, uh, is is I can't remember. It's a wilderness area at the thirty seventh latitude. P A H R O C. That's how it's spelled. If I remember right. There it is, Pay Rock Summit. Oh. The, the petroglyphs on that longitude line, there's petroglyphs there. That marks the positive side of the lines that I was talking about. And on that, in between those lines is Mount Wilson, exactly between Becky's Peak and Pay Rock petroglyphs. Wow. You go to the middle where the Troy Peak area is, which is next to Mount Wilson, that's 115. That's our reality. That 115 goes directly into Las Vegas, that longitude line. And then you go to 116. The Hickson petroglyphs are, out, are on 116th longitude on the other side of Troy Peak. That's the negative line. 
That's the negative astral long, uh, longitude line. And if you go straight down on 116 longitude down, it goes to Area 51 and the Nellis Edwards Air Force. <laughs> yeah, it does. Nellis is right here by uh, Las Vegas. You've got Indian Springs, it Preach goes Air Force Nellis. Base. If everybody knew the amount of stuff stuff that was between Nellis Air Force Base or Creech Air Force Base and Indian Springs, it, it would it would blow people's minds what's out there right under everybody's nose. <laughs> These entities are utilizing abandoned mines as caves to come into our reality. It's just the same what they're doing in, in the natural mountains when they're coming out through the cave entrances or, or temples or whatever they were using in ancient times. They seem to have learned how to utilize abandoned mines for the same purpose. Just an artificial cave. Yeah, you've got <clears throat> Indian Springs and Mercury, all of this area, all the way out here. This is all where they were doing. And that's the, 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 the Tonopah test range. I mean, this whole area up here looks like a. And if you could go to where uh, Summit Peak is, that's where that petroglyphs are at. That uh, describes that line, that astral longitude line. It's, um, uh, which summit peak? Yeah, summit peak, or you could put down a uh, Hickson Petroglyph Recreational Area. Hickson Petroglyph Recreational Area. Yeah, that's the what the one that marks the negative longitude line that I was referring to that goes down from that point on. So I've never been to this spot. I need to go here still. Well, that's what I'm letting you know right now, because my research has done a lot of this, but I was never able to communicate any of this because I was going across everything. <laughs> this I'm kind of you know focusing on one certain specific. That's why I said you can relate to this because it's around Mount Wilson. That's it's amazing. Like yeah, and <clears throat> people have to realize too that the petroglyphs that are in Nevada have been dated to be some of the oldest in the world, meaning like older than the pyramids in Egypt or around the same time. Well, it's interesting you say that because the the that what you're looking at right now is connected to the other petroglyphs at Lake Winnemucca, which are the oldest petroglyphs in the Americas. There, there, there's a marking from that area on down where they were doing ancient mining, which was a triangle for minerals. But if you go down to the 40 degrees where Becky Peak is at, there's another triangle, which is what I call the astral triangle which is why you're running into these things that are going on at Mount Wilson, because it's directly on that line. Skinwalker Ranch isn't on that line like Mount Wilson is. I mean, uh, you're exactly on the positive line. Um, these, are those, these are those Hickson ones. Yeah, those are the, the petroglyphs that are, that are in relation to the minerals in that area and also to what I'm talking about, this astral longitude. The skinwalker that you found over the Unitaw Basin was telling you that you're one longitude line away from that astral line where they travel, basically. And that line is 111. It's called Baldy Peak. Baldy Peak, uh, which is next to King's Peak, is that uh, 111 marker for the negative line for the area at the Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch, believe it or not, it's located on the positive line which is kind of interesting. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> King's Peak is at 110. This is our reality. And 109 is the Unitaw Basin. And then that's the, you know, the, the positive astral entity line. 111 is Baldy Peak. That's, you know, where the skinwalkers will wander up and down. You know, if you went to Baldy Peak, you probably find a lot of activity going on, going on in that range. Wow. The reason I know is that uh, the other end, that 111, uh, also on that longitude, astral longitude line, is a place called Black Mountain. And uh, if you want a little later, I'll show you a video of this guy that was a guide. He was got, uh, taking these people out to do some specific thing, and this entity showed up that was blowing their tent open and lightning and what's going on. And they tried to lock and close the, the thing again. But when they both woke up, there was like um, a big black blob entity standing between the two of them that freaked them out that they never wanted to go. They ran to the guide and made them leave at that and said they were never coming back. Oh uh, yeah, Pyramid uh, uh, Lake is connected to the Chinook trade uh, as well. 
if you look uh, closer at Pyramid Lake, there's also a Sphinx in that bunch there. That one you're looking at here, where the Winnemucca, if you look closer at it, it's real, that right here where it says uh, Petroglyphs Winnemucca, right there. Yeah, the one you're looking at. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's a fish, a, a statue of a fish that was shattered by some cataclysm in ancient past. Really? If you look at the Winnemucca things, you'll notice closer that there's fish scales on it. They even shows you fish bones. <laughs> that are on it. It's a, like a giant fish or a carving of a fish? A giant statue of a fish that used to be there at one time. I don't know what no happened. No kidding. But in cataclysmic time, that, that shattered it into pieces. If you get a chance, go to look at the Winnemucca petroglyph and you look at it from a distance. See, the scales are right there on that one that you went by. That was up there a little bit further. You can see the scales of the fish. You can even see the eyes and the mouth, and it's just broken. You know, it's, it's a big fish. That's yeah. so wild. Look, there's the bones right there. <laughs> see? Look at the way they they carved all this to even almost like look like scales and things look at it it's like a broken jigsaw puzzle if you put it all together it makes a big fish but it that's was wild that's the winnie mucka petroglyphs that are connected uh to also to the the hickson um petroglyphs recreation area and i learned that uh, the the main thing was uh the pay rock ones are also the entrance going into where the ancients went to to look for their minerals that were in this area. There was um, apparently there's turquoise, serpentine, copper, silver, and a section that where gold can be located, and that's why that was an important location globally. For everybody to go through to you know pick up their gold and run before the youths you know got you <laughs> right <laughs> make some quick money and run before the indians get you and that's why a lot of those shelters are there because a lot of those are just little mining camps by they set up and a lot of the times when you're out in your sites if i ask you have you found uh how much ports have you found at the sites that you were at and then you told me at all of them um, they're 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 trying to locate uh, minerals within the ports at all these sites, and it was a hotbed for looking for silver and gold. And I guess apparently veins of them can be found in quartz. And that's exactly, what... yeah. Everywhere that we go, we find unique geology um, that has to do with that. There's abandoned mines. There's abandoned archaic-looking mines that look older than like settlers and pioneers and even older than maybe Spanish. And then there's always uh, quartz, weird magnetic rocks, uh, uh, lots of interesting mineral deposits. And and then we find weird artifacts that are always <clears throat> out of place. <laughs> like uh, I wanted to jump back really quick and shout this guy out, Wandering Wolf, who I think needs a little bit more subscribers and attention because he's going out doing some amazing work. I, I would love to go with him. Well, uh, one of these days, we ought to just go up there and do a show at Sage Mountain and and, and show it ourselves uh, with their blessing. And, and exactly. So this is the Sage Wall at Sage Mountain. I don't want to steal his content. I just want to preview it for you guys to go check out. Well, this is credit. part of what... Yeah, we're giving him... Wandering Wolf, if you want to look further on YouTube. Exactly. He's got all this cool merch and stuff for sale. So big shout out. I'm sure he'll appreciate the shout out. And he's uh, doing you a great service because he's showing you something that rivals the wall of Sakshi Yuman down in Peru. And this yes. is America where there's a wall that rivals the same walls in South America that no one knows even exists. Exactly. I'm not going to show any more because I want everybody to click the link when they're done watching this video if I decide to upload this. megalithic this. structure is connected to the megalithic uh, um, polygonal floors uh, at um, Skinwalker Ranch. That's at 40 degrees. The medicine things you're finding at 39 degrees are for the people in the trade zones going down from 39 to 29. Just look at just this little tiny. I said I wasn't going to show any more, but I really want people to go see that. Check this guy out. Look, yeah. I mean, okay, look at this. Look at this. Look at that. How it's and you're placed. trying to say it's natural. Can you believe that? I can imagine a glacier putting that together. 
<laughs> the whole thing is really interesting. And then if we jump back to Google Earth, um, that place right there was our place that was the place called Two Ocean Pass, which is at 43 degrees, if I remember below it. And from Two Ocean Pass, one river goes to the Pacific, to the Columbia, and the other one can take you all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, going all the way up to the Ohio and all the way the other way. So we could send things out to both oceans from that one location right below Sage Mountain. And that's an ancient Chinook Trade Network headquarters, which was connected to that floor that's that Skinwalker Ranch up on that mesa. Is that's this where Sage Mountain is, clear up here? Yeah, that's the Sage Mountain Center. Are they... I have a, the video clip, I have a, a information where you can actually contact them if you want to make reservations, you know, to, to visit that place and they'll give you, you know, your, your, their blessings and, uh, and how to go about doing it. And might even be, you know, it could even, if you want to do even a workshop there, if you wanted to, cause that's what it's set up for. That's amazing. So and just to kind of like help people grasp everything, cause it's a lot to try and and it's a big pill to swallow. Fathom, it's a big, you're right. It's a big pill to swallow. So these, these unknown or lost megalithic structures like this wall at Sage Mountain that you just saw on, on the YouTube channel. Um, if you follow the line and the way that that's built or the purpose and intention of that megalithic wall, it reveals uh, what you're saying is an, an ancient indigenous trade network and a spiritual network that connected a lot of these places that were of tremendous importance to people uh, that we've completely forgotten. And there's like a, a map almost that connects all of these together where they were using the stars and their spiritual rituals and everything like that in order to connect with these different locations and to travel from one to another. And you're saying, both physically, but also like spiritual doorways, like on the astral plane. Is that correct? Yeah. It's kind of like, in a sense, would be like indigenous ley lines, I guess you would say. The ley lines, yeah. And if you look at the, the earth as a human body, our ceremonies and our rituals were all set up and including the stones that we put into the earth as uh, earth acupuncture. Yeah. And the uh, only way I could describe it. And so we did our summons rituals to, to heal the earth through these um, stone monuments, which were put into, there's no different than a pin being put into a body for acupuncture treatment. Right. And you so when, to keep so the when they would build a pyramid or like a, a tower or one of like the Navajos or the, the ancient spiral on top of the, uh, what would you call it? They've called it the Navajo Stonehenge or Navajo spiral or circle. Well, That's get, what do you... We don't even know actually who built it. Uh, Navos, I'm not too sure about them making spiral vortexes like that. To be honest with you, what I see on that is something from uh, BC. It may not even be tied to the U or a of the Shoshone even. It, I, it looks like it's part of why it's messed up is because it, yeah, it's been it's worn over. Like the center rock has moved out of place, but you've got this big spiral going on here and then the back to that cataclysmic uh, um, event that happened it shattered this entire structure because I, I believe it was an ancient temple that was right. used to worship the ancient gods because at 39 degrees like i was mentioned earlier that's 180 degrees you know or half a, a sphere half a globe uh and that and that where is that 39 degrees latitude i mean that means 39 degrees northwest, that's one globe. 39 degrees east and west, there's another globe. And then you put all of those together and you and you do a, a 39 squared and you go a mile above that location, you go to a 78 vibration, which is not, it's a, twice as 39, which is that anomaly that, you know, Travis and them are running into above Skinwalker Ranch. The vibration is different there because it's squared. 39 squared. You got north and west is 39. East and west, 39. 39 times 2, 78. <laughs> I don't know how you figured all this out. Maybe. Uh, it's in business physics. It has nothing to do with Eurocentric uh, knowledge, numbers, or anything at all. 
I mean, to be honest with you, Kyle, well, and, and you, know, you in, I, inherited you inherited this a lot from. It was it your great grandfather or great great grandpa? Uh, my great great grandfather Charles Colty uh, ran the Chinook Trade Network uh, back uh, when the Cossacks were in a tribe that existed before the courts made us extinct. And he ran everything you're looking at right here. He understood everything I'm talking about right now. As a matter of fact, uh, um, I have a lot of respect for my great great grandfather because even I thought, you know, that that time when he was around, they were, you know, living primitive. That's when I learned to use primal. No, there's a difference between primal and primitive. My great great grandfather lived primal, which is he worked with the laws of nature. And all my numbers have to do with the laws of nature. I described, you know, the 35 degree latitude for the mountain ranges all the way to the Mount Fuji, you know, 39 mountains all the way to that underwater wall. You know, they're still busy arguing about the Bimini wall being natural or man-made over there at the Bermuda Triangle. And I'm showing a wall that's connecting America to China as underwater. <laughs> well, they're on the other side arguing about a, that's not even a kilometer long. I don't know. They're wasting their time arguing about that one over there, you know. <laughs> and the Bimini Wall, you know. When you got where is that Bimini Wall supposed to be? It's supposed to be. Uh, what I'm never want? gonna spell that right. <laughs> B i m i n i. B i m i n i. Oh my gosh, Bimini it, Road. Mm hmm. It'll it'll take you right there. And they're, they're, they're worried about that little tiny little section that's not even a mile long. Yeah. See? And they're I'm all... the one that's going from Cape Mendocino all the way to um, Japan, which, you know, that's a little. So long. everybody's fretting about this like it could be a man made wall, the Bimini wall. Yeah, they're arguing about it. But then look at what, what you were talking about. The wall that I just posted going from. No, Cape. you can you can you can see Rogers' wall from space. Oh, geez, I'm all. Look at this wall. There it is. Oh, <laughs> see where it goes, Carl. See where it goes. Follow it. <laughs> well, here I want to show everybody how crazy this is too. So when you how follow it, goes. so yeah, and then it comes down this way. I might be out too far. Am I? No, keep going. Yeah, because I, I, I can tell you an idea where I think it's going to go. And this is going to probably freak people out. At 24 degrees, our port, seaport was Kuluyukan for our area. At 24 degrees on the other side is the Yanaguni underwater pyramid. It's It really is what it is. It might be going to that area. That is wild. You see that fish on there? Go back to Japan. Go back to Japan. Uh -huh. Now go, go up toward north, go north, up north. See that thing that looks like a fish? Yeah. That's the rune. That's from the Odin rune. That's what they use to go from Asia to America by going on the Aleutian Island chains to get to us and us to get to them. That's a fish rune. Where? Mm -hmm. Where is it? I don't, okay, I thought I saw it. Now I'm not sure. Scroll down a little bit further. Go, no, the other way, the other way, the other way. The other way, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right there. That fin, the nose, the tail fin on the left this? side. Yeah, that's the, the rune. That's the fish rune. And you follow the Aleutian Islands, it takes you to Alaska. And you follow this, it takes you to Asia. And then you have to go through here to get there. See? It was the whole way that the route that they took all the way to come back. Oh. See? Oh, and then you follow that fish. It takes you down toward uh, the, the northern island of Haikido uh, in Japan. They were they're called Ainu now. But in those days, we were trading with the Jamon. They're the same people. It's different in name, but the same people. Yeah, you go down toward Japan, you'll find the Haikido. See, there's Japan. Haikido is the northern island. See, there's the fish and there's Haikido. Now you can see how easy it was to get here uh, both ways. They went uh, right right along here, huh? Uh-huh. And the Aleutian Islands, and there you go. All the way to Haida, uh, Guaya, 
which is up 53 degrees, which is our way of getting things to Siberia and, uh, and to uh, Northern Asia. 39 degrees was getting our stuff to uh, Japan and Central Asia. Going down south toward California was how we got our things down to Australia, New Zealand, and, and to that area. So every, all of these different latitudes had different reasons for you know going to to do to global trade. Yep, there's Easter Island. That is totally in alignment to the so-called mystery wall that that guy on what's his name Scott Walter. He was given the Chinese credit that they built it, and it has nothing to do with them at all. Really, the the Northwest Coast people are those are our relatives. If you follow the straight line, it'll take you right into the into California. And in California, there's uh, buildings that are stone structures that look exactly the same as the ones on Easter Island, but they're in California. They're the same buildings. But the hardest part is that nobody wants to believe us natives because, you know, we don't got a third degree or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, from Easter Island, Tahiti's right next door. And then right next to Easter Island. And then there's two islands that are on the east side of Easter Island that take you directly to South America. Uh, our trading partner down there was uh, um, Puma Punka and uh, Cusco and Tiwanaku. Uh, wow. I mean, this is educating a lot for the public. And to be honest with you, the one reason I'm saying everything is because. Uh, the coronavirus uh, quarantine thing, I had a lot of Native people that had passed on, including relatives and friends that I knew. And I start coming to the conclusion that I have all this knowledge and what I don't like to think about. What if I get hit by it and I die? And all what I have, what I'm explaining right now, goes with me. And that's one of the main reasons why I'm trying to get it out, documented, get it out into the public. And besides that, it already got lost once already when the Spanish conquistador came over. I mean, when's the next Roger going to come along if I'm not here? Maybe I, that's why we're trying to talk about it and get it all out there to so get other people thinking. We've, uh, I, you know, my friend uh, Lane the, and Caleb that live up around Skinwalker Ranch and up in that area and everybody that watches this video can go out and as long as they obey the law and they respect the indigenous lands, you don't touch anything. I'm telling you, and Roger can confirm this, if you move a rock, mess with a boulder, touch a stone or anything like that, you can screw up ancient alignments that actually matter or sight stones or things like that. If you pick stuff up and move it around thinking it's cool, even if you thought you put it back in the right spot, you have um, no, no idea how bad you might mess things up. Thank you for bringing that up because the prime example is I was watching one of the Skinwalker series and the anthropologist and anybody that's an archaeologist will will know what I'm talking about. Before you move or even touch anything, you get out your surveying equipment and your datum and you mark out your area and you grid it out and you map everything and you illustrate where everything is before you touch or move anything. I didn't see that there. You know, just pull that rock out and let's dig a 20, 30 a foot hole there. And I'm going, that's not anthropology or archeology. span Did they grid it out? Did they survey it? No, no, that's, that's not archeology. span Right. Most, the hardest part I have about this is I know where all these petroglyphs are located and you know, I know now. And that's why I know that those Mormons in Tempe, Arizona, removed the stone to validate the Mormon religion, saying it was the Maya calendar when it wasn't. It was set up for this mapping system that I'm talking about. And they moved it to Tempe from the Gila River tribe. The Gila mm -hmm. River tribe had to go to war to get it back. Yeah, and then but... up here at Skinwalker Ranch, and then they're moving that stone. And I'm going, man, that's a desecration of sacred places. You know, have a little respect. I mean, you know. I mean, can I go to Jerusalem and, you know, move anything I want around? Or can I go to the Vatican and move anything around over there and get away with it? Have some respect. Common, right. you know, common dignity for a common man or whatever you want to call it. 
But, you know, yeah. need to respect this. If anything, I would like to see is that they should pass a law that protects every petroglyph uh, nationwide, whether it's on um, private or, or, or on government land, and uh, that it should be a law passed to protect all petroglyphs from vandalism and destruction. I mean, there's one thing about being American. I mean, love America for what it is and not for what it can make you. That's the problem with the white man, you know? And it's not all about money. You know, you got to get off the capitalism nonsense, you know. And, and the other thing that gets in the way is the religious and political agendas, you know, that get in the way. Like they want to validate, you know, their, a religion or or they want to make a political point, you know, but at whose expense? Right. Are they doing serious research? No, they're just pushing their own political or religious agendas, you know, and if it doesn't fit that, they throw it out. That's right. not science. That's not real research. Yeah, like on the on the historical records, it only records in the state of Utah, like between like 15 to 20 different battles between the Mormons and the Native American tribes like the Tempanogos, Shoshone and the Utes and stuff. Yeah, and but in awesome. actual in actual history, there was hundreds of battles. There was an, an almost an entire genocide of all the way down here to Arizona. Of the Tempanogos, and then you've got over 20 years of generational intertribe and between the Mormon kidnapping and human slave trading going on for, for you know, a long I'm time. The, my traditional background is that uh, we were headhunters and cannibals, and uh, we had slaves, including white ones. So, I mean, that's the only reason I know about it. Yeah. Because you know, people did it. And I wouldn't be talking about it, you know, if I didn't know it, and I'd be, you know, stupid to be in denial if I said my people didn't do it and somebody dig it out of my background later you know that's yeah, the... I'm, a hunter, I'm a cannibal but I'm a former head hunter and a former <laughs> yeah, but hey listen my ancestors were Vikings and you think they did anything nice to anyone no way it's like hey, they never... came over to us and they were supposed to trade and they came back as Christian assholes and we had to shoot <laughs> Eric in the ass and they had to throw him in Greenland because we oh my god you were all right before you were Christians but now you're assholes now we got to shoot you in the asshole Ugh. you know I know and then it's all it's all mixed and that's where in Iceland you got the the Vikings came over they went they got converted over to Christianity and then they kept some of that interesting stuff so you've got over in India you've got these uh man, mandalas these kala chakra mandalas like we've talked about these wheels of time mm -hmm. that even have medicine wheels met wagon wheels and even the meditation uh, mandalas you can find them on the on the walls and on the floors in nazca i've got them one tattooed on my elbow that's the icelandic it's a basically oh. a it's a it's a mix between viking and christian culture but it's also a, a when they were just mixing with native american stuff too and trying to do it all it's really fascinating to me how they were all blended and uh to i wanted to do a, a formula an equation before i forget for the archaeologists and the academians out there that are wondering what the heck i'm talking about with this global mapping i'll, I'll i'm going to go through a real fast example but i'll go slow enough that you, if you need to you could write it down and double check it if you want it's a mixture of Mesoamerican numbers, 13, with the Anazazi Zia symbol, 16, totally indigenous numbers of this area. You take the Mesoamerican 13 and you multiply it by 2 to start with, which gives you 26. So that's the Mesoamerican side. Now you take the Zia symbol, which has 16 rays on it, or the New Mexico state flag, so you take that 26 and now you divide it by 16. So now you got 26 divided by 16, which will equal 1.625, which is the real number for the golden mean ratio. Now you take the golden mean ratio or the 1.625 and you multiply it by two. When you multiply it by two, it comes out to 3.25 or 3.3 and a quarter. And that quarter can be used to 
be divided into a full number, into a half number, as well as a quarter number, and an eighth number, and a sixteenth number, and so forth, and all of that. So when you get to the 3.25, this is where it gets where my, the global mapping comes in handy. I'm going to show you just one trade alignment, how, to, how I use 3.25 to find global location. 3.25 times 2 equals 6.50 north. And why do I say that? That is the latitude for Nanmadol Micronesia. Now you take 3.25 and then you times it by 4. When you times it by 4, it gives you 13.00 north and what it, oh that's in uh, south america that one that's that's the op that's the wall that's like the one in skinwalker ranch that's at yeah. east south america the the polygonal polygonal wall there and then uh, three, tell me which chart to pull up while you're doing all this math for everybody okay let me see um, i had this one up but i just to show the zia symbol down there yeah just to show the zia symbol uh, I, I don't know if I sent you the 3.25 information on it, but there's a Zia symbol with a 16 on it. And the 3.25 times uh, 4 makes 13.00 north, which is the latitude for Angkor Wat, Cambodia. And if you take 3.25 and you times it by 6, it gives you 19.50. Oh, I might have a, 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 one of the maps you have there has an alignment that's a straight line that goes to the Azores Islands which is the, if, can you scroll a little bit and I'll see if I can see it. Cause I know yep. I sent it to you. That's yeah, your great, great hey, grandpa. Hey, grandfather. He's there the he inspiration for everything I'm doing. He understood everything I'm talking about now in the 1800s. I admire that man. That is amazing. There's his Franz Boas. I don't know if anybody knows who Franz Boas is. Okay. Go the other way. Let's see if I could find that. Cause I, it was one of the maps, the earlier maps you, that you showed earlier. I might, I might not have uh, thrown it in here yet. Let's see. Or maybe I saw it on your on on one of your shows. One way back to my three point two five um, times uh, six is nineteen point five zero north, which is the latitude for Mumbai, India. And if you take three point two five and you times it by nine, it'll give you twenty nine point two five north which is the latitude for the giza pyramid in egypt and then if you take 3.25 and times it by 12 for all 12 longitude lines for 180 degrees it takes you to 39.00 north which is the latitude for the azores islands and that's how we utilize our indigenous or our rational pie uh, for finding global locations and not only used one alignment it can be used globally but that one goes, you know, where you can see it increments as it goes across the, the earth. Oh, yeah, that one right there is when I was doing the lining up of the mountain ranges to figure out where all the, the minerals and vortexes and things were at. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is all in Nevada here. Huh? I don't know if I got this right here. This do, you, do you have it where you can share it in, in your computer folder, just like you did your... I, did I make this into a, I don't think I made this into one because it, it has the mineral locations on it in Nevada. Oh. It, it, in other words, it's got a gold map on it. You know how white guys get about gold. Hey, there's a dinosaur. <laughs> Tell everybody what that is really fast because I did a whole video where I talked about a petroglyph that I thought was a dinosaur and you were like, no, that's a. That's, that's a, a three, shape, rivers, shape. Uh, three Rivers petroglyph area that, that's down here in southern New Mexico, and uh, which is really interesting because it's lined up <laughs> so to the cool. place outside of uh, Fort Worth, which is um, another place where they, were, they found human footprints with dinosaur tracks. <laughs> <laughs> so here is a petroglyph of a man, right? And this would be a normal villager, right? Because he's got a round head with no clothing. He doesn't even have earrings or tunic or anything on. So he looks like a normal villager or hunter. And here he is like with it, like it looks like a velociraptor. 
Well, you know what he looked like he's doing? He's going on a roundup to, to, to like you said, to ride a, a dinosaur. Like he's trying to catch it, to ride it. <laughs> uh-huh, I got, he's got a rope and he's going he's gonna to get it and it's trying to get away. I mean, you yourself ran into dinosaur uh, petroglyphs and I know some other natives here in Navajo that have ran into uh, dinosaur petroglyphs as well. There's, a, all there, over the place. there's more. A lot of them are on reservation land or on private land and the people that own the land that they're on do not want it to get out that they're there because they know they'll just get a, an archaeologist friend of mine the way that he put it said people will love it to death they'll love it so much they'll ruin it they'll not only it. love it to death it'll go the other way if this is motive smithsonian gets wind of it it'll disappear right they'll, yeah like the the mormons did with the whole stone that they thought was a mayan calendar so they stole it and put it in the back of their temple grounds in Arizona yeah, and Tempe. To validate their, you know, their religion and that's not so even they, their culture. They messed up an entire uh, solar calendar and alignment and a migrational chart and everything moving that. They have no idea. What they're doing. Truth really, Carl, there's a law against it. It's called cultural appropriation. Right. There's a federal law against it. But that's I true. Guess but if you do it in the name of God, I guess there's exemptions. But God, gold, oil, and drugs. That's they make, the, they make the world go round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and upside down and sideways, and then it gets deflated like a balloon. <laughs> not, not the world that we're trying to live in, right? That's the whole idea of the, everything that we're trying to do with this Free Indigenizing Minds Project. Because the whole point in finding where these medicine wheels are and these indigenous locations are is not to go find them all and expose them and get them pillaged and overrun and ruined but to preserve them because they are getting built over top of and people are doing graffiti and where they are and what's there is, is getting lost and we're trying to map them all and validate it and not only that <clears throat> there's a lost spiritual system here that I've experienced accidentally and intentionally myself and that other people have toyed around with and got hurt with messing around with that we know of and like well the entities uh if you respect them you're all right if you disrespect them oh boy yeah like Roger's talking about this is not only just a migrational trading route for ancient indigenous people but it's also <clears throat> a ley lines Astral longitude. That's remember I was using that term. That's what talk about that. Tell everybody what that means, Roger. Astral longitude line is is the same like like our earthly line of our longitudes where we travel to do our trade and our normal everyday activities, but to the to the sides of us uh, are other two lines which are the astral longitude lines which astral entities travel along that we're not aware of that are either above or below our ways of sensing them either by seeing or hearing because they're above frequency or below our frequency that we can't yep. see them but they're there and they're right next to us uh, all the time whether we realize it or not we're just in the middle longitude the reality longitude which is the zero five but the ones on the sides of us those are the the what white man would call them ley lines that are used for these electromagnetic things they refer to and talk about it's yeah. those but you know i'm trying to explain it without sounding too new agey you know because uh, i mean this is ancient agey i guess but <laughs> i try to steer away from sounding too too new agey because i get caught in that category then then i get branded pseudoscience and and nobody bothers to look at my equations nobody bothers to double check my work that's why I've, put the equation out there for archaeologists and scientists to check themselves, you know, you know, be, be, you know, before you condemn me to, you know, to academic hell, you know, um, double check my work before, you know, condemn me. Right. You might find out that I'm right and you, you might be wrong. You might really, learn. And it, it, it is that key. Not only are you going to be able to validate a lot of this stuff and realize that these places all connect, but like if, what we're talking about, what Roger's mentioning too, with these astral lines or ley lines, there's convergence points. There's those X points where they intersect, those, they intersect where our physical reality, where our trade route or migration would 
go intersects and overlaps. And in these places, you find artifacts. You find these megalithic stone circles and different things like that and all kinds of paranormal poltergeist stories, right? Yep, and the intersection points vibrate at 78. We vibrate at 39. Right. And so what the- do you think happens when someone walks into, like, wanders onto reservation land and they end up in one of these locations? Like, imagine, like, Chris Bartell, he's working on security at Skinwalker Ranch, has no idea what he's looking for. So he's walking around up there on the upper mesa, taking sleeping and taking naps in the the stone spiral and on the polygonal trade floor. He's up there sleeping there. And then he starts having these like a spiritual evolution that well, remember he's on he's on the positive astral line. Right. That's why he was connected to Orion. Now if he was doing it on Mount Baldy, uh, we might not ever hear a bit from him again. Right. And if you go in to these locations with bad intentions and disrespect and you and you deface things and take things, that's where they all talk about this hitchhiker effect and stuff. Well, and the other effect, I saw a video clip and it was really freaky because there was a lady that was videotaping a lady calling for help, but she couldn't see her. But she could, you could hear it on the videotape. You could, like, she was, you know, the, um, you know, and her voice started getting distant. And that's when it occurred to me that if tourists don't understand any of these, um, you could wander into one of these places and you may not know it and may not know how to get out of it. And like I said, if you go into these places with the wrong intent, with the wrong heart, the mountain will swallow you up and you'll never be seen again. And a lot of times these people are unaware, and I believe a lot, not all of them, a few of them step into these portal entrances and they can't get back out. And that's why people can hear the voices, but they can't see them. Yeah. But they're, you know, they're, and then they're gone for years and all of a sudden their bodies are located because somehow after a certain point, they come back into our reality again. Cause they, that's this port portal swallow yeah. them up this is why we have interesting things in my theory why when we walk around mount wilson ranch and we hike up to the stone circles and the shaman cave and the medicine wheels up there that we find all kinds of stuff on the hillside laying around that doesn't seem like it fits there and all kinds of weird gps readings like that are picking up locations that aren't even in nevada well, uh, that, and then you that cave is one of those places I tell you where the entities can come out. Remember, I was talking about abandoned mines, they use them and they use yeah. natural caves. The caves are utilized by these entities for these um, lines of the, how to travel. And that's oh. why you find readings that come from New York State, and that's why you find readings in these caves that come from Florida, but they never come from Nevada because you're picking up these other locations that it's connected to. Make Roger, sense. did you watch the video when I went with Chris Bartell and Brent and those guys and I did the meditation in there with the headset on? Yeah. And I had like that kind of vision where I interacted with the shaman. Yeah. You just, you just kind of made me realize something because what the message that I got from him, I, I asked him like, what is this cave? What is it for? And what basically the message that I got was, <laughs> I feel so dumb now because <laughs> he was saying oh this is halfway it's halfway between when I'm going from here to there and the impression that I got and the way that I interpreted that was halfway from going down to like hunt in the meadow to going up somewhere else higher up the mountain but what you're saying is that the cave is halfway between Becky's Peak and the Parak Petroglyphs exactly in the middle and also halfway in between our physical reality and an, another parallel dimension too. It's you're it's saying it's a left door, left. it's a doorway. <laughs> he was telling you the truth. He was, he was like, I was like, what is this cave for? And he's like, it's halfway because it's in between mm-hmm. here and there. And I, it went right over my mm-hmm. head. Tell you, you're halfway into their dimension, and he's halfway into ours. Wow. Okay. Is that why you think? 
that feeling of like there's water flowing under there, like that thumping sound you hear under that. We keep thinking in primitive terms about what well, we should be thinking electromagnetics instead of bottle rockets. Water is a, a is good for steam engines in the you know 1800s. Yeah. What they're utilizing is what's a byproduct of water. They're utilizing the hydrogen that's in the water. Oh. See, different approach. You use water to make a steam engine. You use hydrogen to create a hydrogen engine. Space travel. Right. Well, even just the way they would interact with our reality at a molecular level would be interesting like that. Their intentions could be completely different from us. Now you got this hydrogen that's running up against quartz crystal, piezo crystal. The same crystal is used for computers. What energy is it producing? And it's traveling under underground uh, rivers and uh, currents that we can't see. It's going to make a magnetic field like a theta waves that affect it's your brain. It's making some and... kind of a natural energy that is similar to electricity that we're not aware of yet from what I'm seeing. And it has to do with this hydrogen being combined with the quartz crystal and has everything to do with a chemical reaction. While we're thinking like a steam engine with water, when we should be thinking of a hydrogen engine with hydrogen. So these places that are like X points on the ley lines, they're going to have gravitational densities as well. So even in the geology, you're saying we're going to find quartz and gold and abandoned mines and all that kind of pretty consistent in these spots because they're it's well, all overlapping in these locations. The global mapping was set up for every resource in the world. I could use the same numbers and equations and go over there, but on the other side of the world to the Himalayas and go to Afghanistan and all of that. And, and these places will locate lapis mines. They'll locate the minerals for over there with the same numbers. It's instead of turquoise, it'll be lapis instead of, you know, and it'll, it also locates other natural resources that you can't find over here that you could get over there to bring over here. So you could bring things from Asia, from Australia, from New Zealand, you know, from all of that. And also export things from here out to over there. I mean, it's, it's a big pill to swallow, but we were trading no different than we were doing. And we're doing today in New York city at the stock market in ancient yeah. times, but we're, we've lost a lot of uh, history. I mean, there's more to history than 15,000 years was my point a little early when I'm saying, well, yeah. um, they can't go further than 50,000 years because, you know, you know, the colonial reason because they can't let the Indians think they've been here all along or they were going to want their land back and, you know, and all that nonsense. <laughs> and I don't know how they can, archaeologists <clears throat> clear over there at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. They still, even just like last week, they under, they uncover new carvings and statues and motifs and things and as they keep uncovering that i'm like i've seen those i've seen that carving i've seen that symbol and it's the same stuff I, we see clear over here on the other side of the planet and they're digging it up clear over there at gobekli tepe saying that it's like from the oldest known civilization from prehistory on earth this archaic uh society that was all mapping things to the stars and i'm like why won't they admit that that culture and that connection was everywhere those carvings at gobekli tepe in different varieties i have seen all over utah nevada everywhere i go i see the same stuff i'm going to tell you something that nobody knows 3.25 times 11.5 equals 37.375 north doesn't sound like much when you say the numbers, but when you find out what they're matched to, 37 degrees north is the number for Mesa Verde, Colorado, on his Aussie runes. 37 is also the latitude for Gobleke Tepe, and they're on the same global line, Carl. And now you look at it this way. What does Mesa Verde have? It has T-shaped windows that are facing toward Gobleke Tepe. We go to Goblet Tekeri, what do they have? They have T-shaped pillars that are facing Mesa Verde. What do they have in common? They're both T-shaped. Remember, T, breath, life. So they have that in common. 
Now you got the Zia symbol, right? It has 16. What did they find over there in the Tepes? They found a statue that has eight fingers and it has two arms. Eight times two equals 16. There's that number. They were connected as trading partners in the ancient past, even though they're claiming that's the most ancient place in the world. They were uh, apprenticing under Mesa Birdie, who was helping them develop this trade area, but something happened and they buried it because they never came back to finish it. But there or, being- some, or something came through the, uh, the other side. They didn't want it coming through anymore. Like Taxila, <laughs> Pakistan. Yeah, you know, which is uh, at 33 degrees, and on the same global line, you go to the other side of the world at 33 degrees, it takes you to the Gila cliff dwellings. And that's Taxila, Pakistan, and the Alexander the Great, and all those guys, Apollonius, and all the famous people in the world have all gone to that place. 31 degrees, it's a latitude for the Barbekiri Mountain, where I was telling you about Iatoy, the, the creator of mankind. And you go to the global line to the other side of the world at 31 degrees, it takes you to Mount Kalish or Kalish or whatever it's called in the Himalayas, which is the home for Shiva, who was the creator of the universe, which is on the same line as the Babakiri one at 31 degrees latitude and on the same global line. Can you see where I'm going with this? And yeah, I can't you- even keep up, Roger. Your brain's like a calculus abacus or something. I don't know. <laughs> How you do all that. Go to one more. This was my point. Now you go to King's Peak. You know the guy that was on the petroglyph that you showed that has the antlers that was on the bottom of the the hoop dancer guy? That's Canosa or Canusa or some Druid guy that has antlers. That Canusa guy is tied to King's Peak, was the trading partner with the people of Mount Ararat which is also at 39 degrees latitude on that same global line, which is weird because, uh, you know, the Mormons are worried about this Christian thing, but if you really wanted to go there, Mount Ararat, with my research, is directly connected to King's Peak. And that line with the hoop, uh, if you look at it, the hoop dancer is in the half a hoop. What is half a hoop? 180. What is 180? 39 degrees in the ancient indigenous math. And what's the latitude for the Unitar Basin? 39 degrees latitude. Uh, 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 uh. And what's the degrees for over at Mount Ararat? 39 degrees. And what was their trading partner that was at 29 degrees? The Egyptians at Cairo. You know, it's, it's just a mirror of this side of the world to the mirror to that side. Aslam. Mir is Argartha uh, over there in the Pamir Mountains. And the Pyramid Peak is Atslan on this side of the world. And they all have the same story. They're all underground civilizations where the people went, you know, that are going to come out later to build a better world. Same story, just different sides of the world. It's all connected, Carl. Close my mind, Roger. Tell me, buddy. You should try researching it. Oh, Marble Canyon, the Egyptians did go through there. I don't know if they had a certain colony in there, but they did go through there to trade. Marble Canyon was the main route to the Little Colorado River, which was the route that came down from King's Peak and went down the Little Colorado River, and then it went to Zuni. It wasn't Zuni, Washington. It was the Zuni River, which went down to Springerville, Cholo area, where they got on to the Salt River at the Salt River Canyon, which would take you down to the Casa Grande, or to the Phoenix uh, uh, Hohokam uh, city in the Phoenix area. Uh, it's directly connected to the Unita Basin, hmm. to that area. It goes right between um, uh, Petrified Forest and uh, Canyon de Chez, that, that trade route. So that Marble Canyon is the little yeah. route. So Marble Canyon's right here. And if you keep following this us is, all the way this down. Is, this is where I live, right, in this, on this stretch of road right here. I won't say where. But from Marble Canyon to over here. Oh, my gosh. My cat's in my room and just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got all my pets out of here. and She just walked through my legs. I, uh, at least it wasn't a spirit tearing your pants like at Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> right. Give you a blowout. This is crazy. Yeah, the, the route that I'm finding out is that there's a connection that 30, 
Well, your what were you calling that? The little black mountain? Is that little what black it is? mountain? That's a site. Yeah, Arizona, um, Utah area. Let me see if I can find it. I wrote a chart. It's right here. Because I did all the math and it came out to these specific places. So I've filmed several videos here. This is where, <clears throat> like, there is this airport here. But from out here south in the desert, had a two Black Hawk helicopters fly up, fly around the mountain and go back south. You better be careful. They're they're checking out what we're doing because we're light years ahead of anything they're doing, and they know it. <laughs> we're ahead of Bigelow. We're ahead of the Skinwalker uh, research team. Even. I need to go back and look at some of these sites overhead because I've never even looked on top of this mountain. Well, to be I honest, would be shocked if there's not a medicine wheel up here somewhere. See the the. What was I saying? The Hickson petroglyphs at 39 degrees is connected to the petroglyphs at 37 degrees with this little black mountain, which is connected to 35 degrees, which is the Petroglyph National Monument here, which is connected to 34 degrees, which is Hidden Mountain right below us at Los Lunas, which is connected to 32.5, which is uh, the Three Rivers petroglyphs uh, in southern New Mexico. And that's what I got of all of my math. Of all of the math, it specifically mentions those, those petroglyphs that I just said in, in my research with all of the numbers that I've been doing, which is um, telling me that those are the major petroglyphs for all of the trade zones throughout this side of this world, I guess. You look at it realistically, if you go to the Sandias, it gives you the trades to go up to Canada, up into Cahokia, and that way. And if you go down toward this way, where the Three Rivers area, that takes you down into uh, Chachi Kalko and, uh, uh, and um, down toward Teotihuacan and Manza Neo. I can't even say the word down there. That one takes you down to the Mexico route. And then if you go the other route, which is the one that you're talking about right now with the King's Peak, mm -hmm. it takes you to Guaymas. And you go one longitude off of Guaymas and you go straight down past the equator. It takes you straight to Easter Island. In other words, King's Peak is connected to Easter Island. King's Peak. I'm going to go back. King's Peak. Utah is connected to Easter Island. This is Muffin. I'm going to go. There it is. Check out my cat. And cool. Goes, <laughs> I can't. I had to feed because she would have been having a fit right now. Oh, Mrs. Gosh. Bitter, she becomes a cute cat to a brat cat. Yeah, Kings Peak. And I believe that there are some lakes near there that, that's called Mirror Lake or something that, that the astral entities would travel in and out of. But like I said, they learned how to use artificial lakes, artificial caves to do those things now, which explains Bottle Hollow. So let's see, we got King's Peak. Sorry, I'm a little bit far away from my mic now. Mm -hmm. We got we got Bernal's over here. Right up here is where all these petroglyphs are that I find along this ridge. I found some here, right here. And then this is uh, Ashley Creek there. Okay, how far? This, this goes up. This is where all the... Uh, McConkie Ranch petroglyphs are. Dry and how, far, how far is Green River from this location where those where those petroglyphs are that you just showed me? The Green Green River. Uh huh. Uh, it comes straight down. So here's Fort Duchesne. Here's okay. There's Uray. It must Skinwalker be Ranch. It's over here near Uray. Where's you go to Uray? To the right. To the right. The other right. Green River, Utah, or wait, yeah. or the, oh yeah, that's Green River. Now, if you follow the Green River, those petroglyphs are relations to that river and, and to the Ashley Creek. That's why it's, they're there. Look, think of it as a trucker and that there, there are signs on the interstate or you're at a truck stop and it's telling you where you need to go to deliver or where you need to pick up things, you know, and it 
look at it that way as like if you were a trucker and uh, petroglyphs are designed pretty much the same way how to get to the next next place to trade and you know, or how to get to the next place if you're traveling and to do business and all that it's set up pretty much the same way as, as a as a trucker would <laughs> on the interstate that's amazing these are the nine mile canyon petroglyphs these probably fall on the same path yeah they go go down through there see they made up um uh, a thing that had four directions uh, uh in my circle and where the lines are at they were reserved for the longitude latitude uh trade lines that i'm talking about and the astral longitudes and then there's other lines that are in between those lines we were set up for the local tribal people to put up their origin stories their creation stories or anything that has to do with the history of their tribe or anything that has to do with their culture or anything like that that was reserved for the local tribes to put any of things that had to do with their culture on those their petroglyphs in those areas but where the lines are at they were specifically reserved for putting longitudes and latitudes to to operate for trade uh when i get together in person i can show you how that's utilized by using a pyramid to find uh these locations i already showed colleen blew her mind that's amazing how to really use a pyramid to you know which i think most scientists are missing the point but they don't even have pyrite so <laughs> so i'm just that's crazy i'm just figuring all this out here looking at this with you because we've got yeah. flaming gorge comes down here King's See, all peak. the river routes that's what all the petroglyphs are for for trade 100 there's king's peak right mm -hmm. here Look, this path comes right down here. This one, this flows right down where all the McConkey Ranch. Okay. Now, put, how far is the Snake River from this area? This is all Dinosaur National Monument, Nine Mile Canyon. I'm getting ready to go explore like 300 acres, I think right here on this corner for, from a, the landowner. There's a serpent that's at um, 39 degrees along the Green River that, that has a location that shows a, a serpent mound. They built a road on it, even, they, but I don't think they know it's a serpent mound. <laughs> wait, wait, where? <laughs> along the Green River. I found it along the Green River. Somebody put a dirt road on, on the serpent that went down to the river. No That's, way. It's going to something in Saddle Back Mountain, I think was its name. It was pointing to something in that mountain range. It was pointing that way. You were saying the Snake River in Idaho? Yeah. How far is the Snake River from uh, that lo location right there? Um, Snake River, Idaho. Snake River, Idaho is probably five, six hours northwest. No, nah, you'd so, be amazed how far the Snake River goes down. To oh, the, yeah. It, it almost goes to the Green River if you follow the Snake River. The reason I'm talking about the Snake River is because I'm going to explain to you my theory about the Skinwalker situation that happened in the Utah Basin. The Nahani Valley comes down right down to my Columbia River. And if you go down the Columbia River, it takes you to the Snake River. If you go down the Snake River, it goes to Idaho and it goes all the way to Utah. And you yeah. just got to go over a mountain uh, range and you're at the Green River and you're in the Utah Basin. And that's how I think the people from the Nahani Valley with their Skinwalker powers got to your area. I'm probably explaining the route. How they Remember I told you that that one group of Diné went there to destroy it, to get rid of them. And yeah. they were all gone. I think they went down this line. and So they came probably right down this line here, huh? I'll or down the river. That's wild. Roger, I'm going to let you go to dinner, my brother. Yep. Uh, uh, that was a lot I gave, but uh, in reality, you know. <laughs> oh, before I go, uh, yeah. I'll mention one thing. I'm opening up things with your crew because there was one thing I'm beginning to realize with our crew. What I just showed you right now, and now you realize it, it's, it's the research needs a bigger team yeah. than what we have here now. I'm proud of what we got done now, but with just Colleen and I and Tracy trying to cover what I just talked about, I mean, we we need a, re, a, a research team that is a lot larger, that has a scientific equipment, people that could help me make a globe in the 0.8125 uh, grid 
with a glo globe formation and put it on a globe. We need people that have scientific instruments to measure these locations that I'm talking about because people start realizing there's electromagnetic differences in a lot of these places. And most important, what I would like to do is a lot of the research I did is by hand. If I could get a team of people to help me verify my work with modern scientific uh, equipment and uh, gear and help me validate uh, what I've been doing by hand, that would make it easier for me. And not only that, and if some of my information is wrong, I don't mind taking positive criticism because, you know, if it's wrong, I don't want to get that out there to the public either. Yeah. You know, look like a fool on national TV. It's not my point. You know? <laughs> well, and at the end of the day, it's like the only way to know you can only do so much. There's been dozens of times where I'm positive I found something on Google Earth looking around. And then I drive all the way out there and go out there and and from what I see, it's nothing, you know. And then other times I think it's nothing and then people watch the videos and they're like, hang on, you missed all this. And I'm like, whoa, okay. You have an advantage here because if you notice, it's not in your cultural window to see how I see. If you notice, I can see things that you can't see. 100%. Not only you can't see that the Skinwalker Ranch research people can't see because it's not in their cultural world it takes time even my friend lane and some of the locals that live up there i just today sent him location where petroglyphs were and he freaked out and he's like i've driven past this place on this road my whole life and never seen these and you can see them right out your truck window from the road and well, he's like i've driven by here my whole life i'm like i just have this eye I'm always looking out the window and it's like, bing, and I just see him, you know. Send me that picture graph of an antelope, but that kind of threw me in for a circle when I went, uh, they're supposed to have hooves and not fingers and toes, and that looks like a canine, and it's next to that Mount Baldy uh, longitude, astro longitude line that it's warning you about. Goes right up the path. <laughs> yeah. It's warning you if you go over that one more longitude line, uh, you're in trouble. That thing is there. That was literal and physical because that border right there and along King's Peak, uh, along there horizontally, was was a a border between the North and the South tribes where they were fighting. You did not go up there. There was hundreds of years where that was no no to go up there. And with bringing the two research teams together, you have something that the other teams never had or never yeah. will have native involvement and a native perspective because we're the type of people that can tell you i wouldn't do that if i were you i wouldn't go in there if i were you i wouldn't go in that see i'm allowed to go in a circle counterclockwise but yeah. only under one condition i gotta go clockwise first to honor the ancient and then right. that give me permission to do what i need to do but not go in it yeah. and can i tell you why you don't go in a medicine circle Yes, please. Same reason why they moved the stone at Skinwalker Ranch. You mess up the alignment if you kick around the stones. And if there's too many people going in and out there doing stupid things, the stones are going to not be where they're supposed to be. And that's the main reason why people don't go in there to keep the alignment in place. You go in there and you got feet, you got people trampling it, they're moving the rocks around. Some idiots actually pick up rocks and move them around and might even, you know, change it. And, oh, that location. Uh, you know that warrior monument mm -hmm. that you went to that has the three pillars? It's got 16 lines in the middle of it, but there's only 15. The 16th line is the third pillar. I'm only telling you this because the medicine wheel you found has 15 spokes and there's one missing. No different than the war veteran here in the 21st century. They must be a cultural thing with the Utes or the Shoshone there about leaving out one for some reason, because they did it even in the war um, um, veteran memorial. They, they did, they put, didn't they? They put a pillar in the place where the, the spoke would have been. I don't know if you noticed that. I'm going to see if pull this up here. And you count the lines, there's 15, and with the 16th one, it's a pillar. Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, look at that. There's eight. Eight times two is 16. You figure out where it's pointing in the north. 
and you take my chart down there with the 39 degrees and put it above your head, it's going to match to that monument. And the monument is already pointing to locations that they have no idea. If they pointed it north and south, it's pointing to Winnemucca, it's pointing to that Cape Mendocino, it's pointing to Cahokia, and they have no idea. <laughs> no idea. See, here's this, here's this wheel. Here's Bottle Hollow where they buried or where they flooded and hid a bunch of stuff underwater. And then here's Skinwalker Ranch right here, this whole area in the Mesa. Uh, I can tell you how they're doing it then. It's, now that you showed me this, they're coming over off the mountain range, like I was telling you, out of that canyon from King's Peak. And they're uh, utilizing not only the lake as a marker, but they're utilizing the stone, uh, I mean, the memorial itself as a navigational uh, tool. They use the same thing here in Albuquerque along, uh, I think the street was Harvard that goes into UNM. Mm -hmm. They have a certain similar stone pond there with stone pillars. And on this one section of Harvard, you see UFOs all the time. But if you go on the next street over, you don't see anything. You go to the next street on the other side, you don't see anything. But just on Harvard, going to that stone pond with the stone pillars that looks just like that, the UFOs are utilizing it to come into our reality for, out of a portal, I guess. That uh, stone uh, serpent that you saw that had the hole in it, that that when you went out and found that petroglyph, where, that, yeah. was by that, that culvert or wherever it is, you need to go back out there because that circle that's on the top if you look at it and you look behind it there's a hole in the cloud it's pointing you to where the vortex is through that stone hole and gotcha. if you align it, it i bet you it goes above the valley above skinwalker ranch i bet probably does and if you look at it why is there a, a hole in the cloud in that in, right where that, that line is that hole is pointing to same thing right above skinwalker it's because there's those cross points those x points in the ley lines create those vortices and those it's, it's 78 a mile above and it's 78 a mile below the vibrations are perfect for the astral entities and we're at 39 in the middle right then the roads that are the, both sides of us both sides of us the other way too we're in the middle we're just too stupid to figure it out we're trying roger we're trying Okay. Yeah, we got to work together and uh, you got to go get dinner. We only think we're smart. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you were getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah, we get we get an E for effort with a small E. We're trying. <laughs> That's right. Well, we I should say that this is the first step that the real ancient knowledge that has been withheld from the non-native has been released to them. And I feel honored that I'm able to get it out. The main reason I'm excited about it, too, is because I had a dilemma because I was arguing with the Pueblos and the Maya and because, you know, they're 13 and 16 and the minds, minds, minds. And I start realizing that they only have one piece of the puzzle. I have all the pieces of the puzzle and I can see the big picture that they can't see. And that's when I decided, I said, I have to just reclaim my great grandfather's work and just pick up the Chinook uh, trade network. And then I don't have to ask permission for me to because then it's my culture. It's right. what my great grandfather would done before me. It was us that created this global uh, mapping system that was utilized by the world, and that everybody, you know, you know, is giving aliens credit for. Right. I'm going to give away another big mystery. Yeah. Um, if uh, a Neanderthal, how big is a Neanderthal? Like, I mean, they could get up to like seven, eight feet. Some of them. Okay, and now a Denise had been uh, was could get to the same height as a Neanderthal. Right. There's your giants. And you know what's interesting about that? What something I just read mm -hmm. is that if a normal human could live to be like 300, 400 years old, certain parts of the body, like your your eyebrows and parts of your bone structure continue to actually grow if your lifespan is longer. You just keep getting bigger. And so some of those 
bones and skulls that they think are these giant Neanderthals might have been ancient people who had a lifespan of 500 to 1,000 years. They could have just been people, ancient people that lived in a long, people, long time and became the giants, you know. People aren't thinking that in ancient times there was more oxygen in the atmosphere. And when there was more oxygen, things grew a lot bigger. And that's why everything they had dinosaurs, that's why they had big trees. And that's why they had big people. Yeah, exactly. And then, and the, then you wonder how they moved those megalithic stones and built the polygonal trade floor in these huge structures. And it wouldn't have been that big of a deal to them, you know? Uh-uh. Not if you're like nine feet tall and you got a team of people. Right. If you're a puny four foot eight, you know, um, um, Peruvian, it's a little harder to lug that around. But you get somebody nine feet tall. And if they were, you know, if it was in a time where we've got things mixed up, we're seeing carvings of humans alongside what look like dinosaurs. Who knows if they were pulling heavy equipment, almost like the Flintstones, right? Um, why do you think they were roping them? <laughs> right. Maybe they didn't have horses and they had to use the dinosaurs. It is just like the Flintstones in Bedrock, uh, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it's all really fascinating. Like, like a cowboy. <laughs> that would be quite a ride, especially if if we're wrong about how they looked and dinosaurs, a lot of them had feathers. It would have been like riding giant chickens around and stuff everywhere. Uh, one of the main problems that the colonialists had problems with is 15,000 years, even though they found petrified footprints in white sands down there. We coexisted with the dinosaurs, whether they want to believe it or not. That's yeah. why these dinosaur pet sort of petroglyphs are everywhere. I mean, you know, you don't think one person ran around to do it as a hoax and then gone to all these places. You know, let's put dinosaur glyphs where, and then you're out in the middle of the reservation. Let's put a dinosaur glyph out here. So we'll, you know, do a hoax. There's too many of them to, to yeah. be a hoax. Yeah. And if there's too many of them, then that means that not, and we know what they look like. I mean, I need to get you together with Roland, the medicine man from Navajo. He's the one that told me about woolly mammoths. And, you know, that we even knew the other woolly mammoths that was even the older than that, that had four tusks. I was watching the thing about Nahani Valley, and this Nahani guy from the Naha tribe, he drew on a rawhide, what he saw, he drew a woolly mammoth with four tusks. One that he saw. Yeah. <laughs> and Navajo yeah. down here remembering for tusk mammoths from ancient times. Right. So how long has the Navajos been here? They didn't just come down 900 AD or 1100 no. AD and nonsense like, no, their footprints are petrified as much as the Pueblos here. Yeah. When they when they were building the pyramids in Egypt beyond and, and when they were standing up the pillars at Gobekli Tepe and carving them and before that, I'm telling you right now, and I would put my reputation all the way on it, that there were people in North and South America and trade networks that were globally, and they were doing the same stuff here. And as much as people want to drool all over Gobekli Tepe, there's the same mind-boggling stuff right around Chaco Canyon and all over, and some of it probably goes just as far back. Uh, Winnie Maka and Pyramid Lake are 2,000 years older than the pyramids of Egypt. 2,000 years older. People don't, and that's in Nevada. In Nevada. On the we haven't gotten to Corral in South America or, or to Monte Verde at the southern tip, which is like 18,000 years old. Yeah, and nobody wants to listen to the origin stories from the Four Corners, the, the mountains and the, uh, of the you Navajo. You came the Bering Strait. Why are the oldest ruins found in, at the southern tip? Yeah. Maybe the other way around. That means we've been here a long time if the oldest ruins have been found in the southern tip of South America. As long as far back as we're gonna be able to dig and try to look, you're gonna you're gonna find traces that there's been people everywhere. There's been my versions of humankind everywhere. My ancestors organized with the people globally were the ones that went around the world globally and built these ancient megalithic structures with their cooperation so we could establish trade with them. But they had to help us to build this thing first before we could locate them. Yeah. We 
help them build the walls of Saxe Human in Peru. We build those floors that I told you at 35th latitude in South America. We build those floors that are above Skinwalker Ranch on that mesa, polygonal walls at Montana. All of the polygonal things you see at Easter Island, the polygonal all of things that are around the world. It was a global effort that was organized by my people to make this trade network happen. And it was with their cooperation that we had been able to get these things built. But my small group of people would be there for a thousand years. But with the local tribes cooperation, we get things done within 20 to 100 years. They've, they've found coca leaves, literally cocaine in pyramids and mummies in Egypt from South America. They found obsidian from Yellowstone in China. They've found feathers from parrots down in, during the the uh, old potato seeds in China too. <laughs> right. They found a sweet potato in the Philippines. Yeah. And guess what? They found a chicken in South America. <laughs> right. Somebody from the Polynesian Islands brought a Polynesian oh, chicken. 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 <laughs> yeah, chicken. Sweet potato in the exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a sweet potato for that bird, sir. <laughs> I think it's fascinating um, how how all of it's interconnected, and it, I think it's just been so long ago that people don't have any idea. Even the like the the ruins that we find at like Teotihuacan, it wasn't that long ago when they were almost completely grown over by the jungle, and parts of it, if you were even walking by or driving by or riding on a horse, you would just think it was a hillside and not even know what you were, what was there. There's still and, like that here in the Southwest are very exactly like that, that nobody knows. 100%. I ran into places that look like Roman and Greek temples and outside of Tucson, Arizona that were in hills. I ran into caves where there used to be crystal trade that was going on that had Sanskrit writings above the entrance. And you had to crawl on your knees and hands to get down into it. But once you got on into it, it was a cave full of crystal that was traded globally. And I guess those guys put a Sanskrit letter in there to know how to locate it. Called Hidden Cave. I mean, there's so much history in what we're talking about that's way beyond anything that's in any, any library or university. Yeah. I might be the key to this coming out because I'm the only person that knows this. I want to, if I end up uploading this, I'm just going to say this for anybody that watches this video later, because I, I think I am definitely going to upload this video. I don't well, know how this center is too good. Well, but I, I think we need to start a discord. We need to have a, I need to create Facebook. Isn't that good for it? Instagram? You, I mean, YouTube's awesome, but it's not great to have community, but I think we could create a discord chat and specifically create a group that focuses on nothing but this. And anybody that watches this video could go and join that discord and talk to you and talk to me, go out and actually try to follow some, see if they find things and take pictures mm -hmm. and post it and see what you think. See, if you make a network like that, you got 3.12 million followers. If we need a, a something from a certain location globally that we can't get to, we just get in touch with them to do it for us. Right. We can't all travel to all these locations. And so hey, you can go out and look yourself and help. We need, an Australian. We need an, uh, 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 something from this location at this certain place over here. At right. Rome. And they go, well, we can go over there. you know. And then all of that can come back. And Roger and Colleen is part of the Reindigenizing Minds Project. Like, this can all be validated and compiled and then published into actually authored works that preserves this history. How to decipher ancient art, and they can go out into their own backyards and decipher their own cultural art from their own people and, and submit it, and we can show the world of what they're finding and what's really in ancient art, and not what everybody's guessing at. Right, that's what part we, of like, when I go- Let alone this ancient global mapping. And we can also help educate everybody how to approach these sites without offending the reservation and the property owners and desecrating and defacing the land and putting themselves in danger or hurting themselves and things. So with what you're doing with this program right now, it's going to teach people to appreciate them from what we're just now talking about to them. It's just graffiti. Yeah. 
But once they heard us what we're talking about and how it was utilized and how it was really used, and not from an archaeologist or not from a damn textbook, you know, from a native person that really, you know, used it, utilized it. You know? Right. The reason I'm here is because I'm tired of the lying I've been hearing in the academic world. I'm broke. I don't have any money. Three blocks over that way, they're getting billions of dollars to do the same work I'm doing, but they're guessing at best. <laughs> You're, that's so true, Roger. It's hilarious. And it's three blocks away that the University of New Mexico has an archaeological department that got billions of dollars of research, skinwalker rats, millions of dollars of equipment, a technical, and they couldn't even see that crap that was outside of uh, uh, Travis's trailer that, you know, shaking them around like a basketball hitting it, you know. And I don't have any money, and I send it to you. And they go to this time space. They're monitoring Travis, and you can see them take off. You can see the entities yeah. take off after he. Here. Went. We got all this surveillance equipment. We didn't see anything. We didn't sense anything. Nothing came up. So open your eyes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I saw. It. I don't even have million dollar equipment. <laughs> <laughs> you do that with me all the time. You. Know, that's why I got in touch with you. I said, that thing got James Keenan in the head. Don't do what he did, or they'll get you next. And that was the only reason I got in touch with you. I said, those guys in Skinwalker Ranch are going about this wrong because if they go about it too wrong, somebody could get hurt or killed. See, Roger was, he was basically screaming at me on Facebook trying to get me to learn how to approach these sites and do things right. And I think most people's initial reaction would be like, oh no. Like a Native American's going to discipline me or chastise me for going out and trespassing on their land or walking around. And the That's reaction, the, what I actually got was that you taught me, you taught me what to do. You're listening to their guilty conscience and that's not, nothing native. That's their guilty conscience, you know, exactly. coming through. You know, they're, they know, they're they projecting know, they know that you shame. screwed native people. You know, you screwed the land and you love America for what it can make you, not for what it really is. If you want to be a real American, you love the land for what it is and for not what it can make you. Then you're on your on your first step to becoming a real American, not this bullshit American that you know we have out here, you know, waving flags around and I'm going to commit treason and you know and that's patriotic nonsense. And white man's got it ass backwards, you know. That even the name Amaruka is way older than the European white colonials claim that the name America came about. Like they named it, it after a, an explorer. The Amaru, Amaru, the formal I think it was Amru Khan. Amru Khan, yeah. And, and America came out of that, but the Khan stands for the serpent. It's the yes. land of the serpent. Guatemala is the land of Guatama, which is the name for Buddha. Yeah. And land of Guatama, and that's why you see all those figures down there in the lotus positions, and they're sitting like those guys in you know in India. You look at the the Omex, and they're sitting in those same positions as the guys that came from the Buddhist. And we we're talking about th this all being Iatoi. Oh yeah, that's amazing. wait wait. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna touch on Iatoi, and then we're gonna wrap this up and save Iatoi for another interview. Mm -hmm. but tell uh, tell everybody just for a minute who Iatoi is. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint so well, you'll know what we're talking about. It's I'll give you the basically the legend. Way at the beginning of time, there was Earth Doctor, and he was the one that created all the stars and all the planets and all the universes and everything that we see in our world, including the Earth. And out of the Earth, he created uh, Iatoi, and Eatoy was created by Earth Doctor out of the Earth. And then Earth Doctor needed help to make other creations. So he got uh, Eatoy to help him create people from the Earth too, as well as he was creating his own people. Another third person snuck in there and started creating people, but he got in trouble for it. That was Coyote. He was making them with you know one leg or one leg too short or an arm too long. You know how Coyote is. He was making them all weird. And uh, <laughs> Eatoy, he was making all of the races that are in the world today from the earth so he created mankind but when man saw the Eatoy for the first time they mistook him for being the creator which in a sense he was because he created them from the earth but what they didn't know is that earth doctor was the one that really created everything earth doctor got a little bent about that and jealous so he got the people he created and he said i'm out of here i'm going to go into the earth he didn't say around 
I'm going to go into the earth and through the earth, and I'm taking me and my people to the other side of the world. And now you got Tibetans in Himalaya. So now I told you about Bobby Kiri being at 31 degrees. Eotoy, the creator of mankind, is at Bobby Kiri. At the other the world is Mount Kalas, which is the home of Shiva. Shiva was the creator and the destroyers of universes. There's Earth Doctor. There's Eotoy. And that's how everything came into creation. It's amazing. And Eotoy is represented by usually the symbol of the man in the, with wearing a hat and mm-hmm. he's standing at the top of a, oh, yeah. of, a, of a maze, right? And he lived inside of a maze and he created the maze was to deceive his enemies from ever catching them because they'd be confused. They wouldn't know how to catch them because he knew how to get through the maze and they didn't. So they would go off somewhere else and he'd, they'd never find him. Eotoy had the, um, the power to either be the biggest thing you ever saw in your life or to the smallest thing in the, in the world. But in his, what he felt was his most natural state was when he was the smallest, because in the indigenous world, the smallest things were the most powerful. And when he was the most powerful, uh, and when he was small, to travel around the globe, he traveled through those cave and underwater uh, uh, systems that are through the world globally when he was these little, short, little people. He had a sister that had a fairy temple, and he couldn't take and handle her no more. So he took her and he threw her out and put her out on an island. We're on a Pacific island. But if you go down to the Baja California, it said there's a lava tube that you can go from there and it'll take you to the island where he would go and visit his sister that had the temper, hmm. uh, which is that lady from Hawaii. What's really? her name? What's that? Um, God, uh, the goddess. Oh, I can't remember her name now. The Polynesian. All artist. I can think of is Moana. <laughs> Disney post. <laughs> but anyways, this yeah. is not being the fire goddess that was that was in Hawaii, which tells me that there's a lava tube that goes from here underground all the way to Hawaii. They tell me there's underground systems globally over the whole world. Oh right? yeah, it's like a honeycomb going yeah. through the middle. Yeah, you can go anywhere you want. But here too, and he could shrink. He he could go to any of the, a little cave system that was so small that nobody human can get through. And that's probably what they're running into at Skinwalker Ranch when they're running into these little tiny caves. They can't figure out how anybody got something in there. You know, I can't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> or he's, you know, like using the interdimensional pathways through the X points and the ley lines to travel. They said that Eatoy sometimes would get so wrapped up in what he was doing, he'd, he'd mess up time space. He'd be going and talking to you, but normally, and then he would stop all of a sudden. And then all of a sudden, he would start going in reverse. He would start doing everything backwards. He would start talking backwards. In other words, he was traveling back in time. Yeah. Everything was going in reverse. And that's what all of these medicine wheels and all of this has to do with conjunction with the rotation of the stars and opening up time travel portals. All this mm-hmm. stuff is all... And he was connected the... to the ant people who were connected to the next people that any time the world is going to be destroyed, that these people will take them in the earth where they'll have a safe sanctuary until the destruction is completed and they could come back out again and start a whole new world. And Eatoy and the ant people and the underground world is that system for going into that cavern system to survive cataclysms. But Roger, everyone wants us to shoot down a UFO. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> they also like to pet buffaloes, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. They like they to like, puppies like to... and grizzlies, too. I'm just saying. They, just, they like not... to take baths and the old faithful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You know that missing 411? Yeah. Uh, it's really uh, the missing 11. The other 400 probably died from dumb tourist stories. <laughs> right. The missing I mean, a lot of, 11. Yeah. Are legitimate. You know, that they might have gotten taken, but the other 400, they were petting, you know, and buffaloes and taking grizzlies. <laughs> and I, Ooh, I got to take a picture of that bear. Right I'm going to stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and take a selfie, you know. Those people, yep. you know, I had plenty of people that's 400 of them right there. <laughs> Probably. I mean, Indians really wanted to get rid of the white man. We just give them all free passes to go to all the national parks. And they get there, they go. They have not come back. <laughs> they, go. they never came back. Uh, they missed him for 100 million. <laughs> right. 
come to Indians are all giving us passes to the national park. Now remember, <laughs> pet a buffalo when you're there and take a pass <laughs> with a grizzly. Go, get in touch with no, nature. No, go. No, pet the buffalo. You're good now, boy. <laughs> the only thing they'll be missing is their pants when it's over. <laughs> that's right. That happened to you already. <laughs> uh, that's happened to me a couple times. <laughs> yeah. Well, was, didn't at least they didn't James Keenan. You you know they just gave you a wedgie. You know James. You know James Keenan got zapped in the head, and the other guy's losing his skull and separating from his brain. Yeah. You know? Thomas. Yeah. The only thing they gave you was a wedgie. I mean, they were just playing with you. Oh, I've got sick before. <laughs> I've got sick before, but yeah, I yeah I've had funny stuff like they that. Worse things, but they did. I think they. <laughs> They gave you a wedgie and they were probably laughing running up the mesa. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I had a sense of humor about it. I was just getting done filming my clip and I thought, wow, I'm, this is actually turning out good. I just got here. I just barely started feeling all good about myself. Rip. <laughs> crazy Indians in that time are no different than this crazy Indian right here in this time. So the, well, I have a sense of humor. I'm pretty sure they blew your pants out and they were laughing. At I you. was laughing too. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I took it. Like, they ah, they I'm got here. me. <laughs> Welcome back. They know I'm here and they're messing with me. <laughs> you should have had a t-shirt that said, crack kills. <laughs> 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 hey, that's Rod a good one to end the note on. At least that's a new at the end. That's right. Hey, Roger. Yeah, I'm going to end the recording here and wrap it up thanks man you're awesome here to in the next round and uh, like i would like uh to have uh colleen and um tracy come on and explain the sacred 260 day calendar which is a whole another subject which they're better at than i am i can sit in every now and then say a few things but their expertise is that sacred calendar and mine is a global mapping and that's why i hog the show when it comes to global mapping because I have the numbers. I know as I get them out of my head, I don't need a paper or a calculator or anything to tell you, blah, 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 blah. Yes, and everybody needs to check the links in the description below uh, for the Discord if we set that up. And also... You check out my equations. You know, I, I get dumped as pseudoscience, but nobody bothers to check out my work or my equations to see if they add up or not, and it annoys me, you know? Right. <laughs> oh, and by the time this comes out, when I publish this, uh, the new... Beyond Skinwalker episode at Mount Wilson Ranch that I'm on, me with Jeff, uh, introducing everybody on the History Channel uh, to Mount Wilson Ranch and its connection to Skinwalker Ranch. That's airing on June 13th. So that will pro either just be coming out or will have already just barely come out. Not so everybody needs to go check that out. I'll put a link to go watch that too. So that's going to be cool. Hopefully they don't edit it all to make me look like an idiot. But Mount Wilson is more connected to that paranormal triangle than uh, Skinwalker Ranch. Remember, I was telling you that. Yeah. Oh, Jeff, he's at the right location. Remember, I told you it's right in the middle. That guy meant more than the middle. It's right between Becky's Peak and that Payrock Petroglyph area, and Mount Wilson is smack right in the middle. And then you wonder why did they pick Area Fifty One and all this like right in there because they at they one know longitude. There's stuff, they, they they know stuff Area there. 51. I went, Area 51, Nellis Edward Air Force Base. I mean, if you go there and you ask them about any reports of Bigfoots or UFO sightings that the military, I bet there's... <laughs> Indian Springs, there's whole documentaries and all that. Chris Bartell has plans to drive me out in the desert and show me some stuff that no one's allowed to see. I'm probably not allowed to film it, but he's going to show me some... Well, we get a chance. We get out to Nevada. We should go to the Payrock Petroglyphs and, and the Hickson Petroglyphs and uh, yeah. and the Little Black Mountain Petroglyphs and, on location and, and do a show from the actual locations where they are. That'd be amazing. Because the Hickson is tied to the one sixteenth longitude, which is the one that's going to Area Fifty One. Troy Peak is the uh, one fifteen, which is the one that's going directly into Vegas, and then yeah. Mount Wilson on one fourteen, which is the the positive. Uh, astral line, you know, longitude line. And that's what yeah. like Becky's Peak and uh, Mount Wheeler and uh, Mount Wilson and um, down to the Payrock. Where it lines yeah. up to the Payrock Petroglyphs is with the what's called Mormon Peak. Yep. That's the beginning of where it starts. And the 35th trade zone is uh, Spirit Peak down uh, near the Arizona, Nevada, Colorado River area. That's the 35th latitude at Spears Peak. That's where was the main trade point for your area. 
Yeah, people have no idea, Roger. Well, they do now. They're starting hey, to get an idea. Show that archaeologist friend of this interview. Oh, he's going to see it. Yeah, he wants to come with us. I met him when I was up there. Up in, yes, uh, I have no problem with showing my work. As a matter of fact, I'd be honored to have somebody review my work. You know, with it. He's that, into all of this. He's really cool. He's a legit archaeologist. He's done stuff at Skinwalker Ranch. I've got a crazy story I'll have to tell you later about what okay. happened to him there. In the meantime, it's, my food's getting cold. Yeah, okay. <laughs> have a good night, Roger. I'm going to let you go, yeah, man. Enjoy. So, Stay well, tuned well, for part two, everybody. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks, just everybody. the beginning. It's just the beginning. Here we go.